I'm really glad you're all here today on this last Sunday already in August. Isn't that kind of sad? Or maybe you're happy and you love winter. I don't know. I'm sad. And welcome to all our Facebook people this hour too. We're glad you're joining us for the service also. Um, This morning we're going to uh, continue in our Grace uh, series. Well, actually, actually, it's not a grace series. It's a good life series, but we're going to look at the topic of, of grace this morning. All throughout the uh, epistle of 1 Peter, which is our material for this good life series, uh, the Apostle Peter has been really talking on this idea that in Christ we should have a significant life transformation. And he, once again this morning, as we get into chapter 4 of, of the epistle of 1 Peter, continues on that topic, only he takes it to a new level. He takes it to this understanding that not only are we to have this new life, this good life in Christ Jesus, but we're to have a life that's full uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit and we're we're the recipients uh, of grace from the person of the Holy Spirit, these gifts of grace, so that we can become then instruments of grace uh, to the culture that we live in. And so I want to begin this morning by just reading to you uh, from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 11. Listen to this scripture. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they all have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober of mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So once again, we're seeing here in this little reading that the, the, the Apostle Peter is saying, look, if you formerly lived like this, now in Christ you live like this. But now in verse 10, he takes it to a whole new level. He says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received. That's a gift from the Holy Spirit to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So now he's saying more than just you live a transformed life. He's saying to you and I, you not only live a transformed life in Jesus Christ, but you are the recipient of some gifts from the person of the Holy Spirit. And you're supposed to live according to the way God has gifted you and bring that grace into the culture you find yourselves in. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So the Apostle Peter, once again in this little section of 1 Peter, is telling us, look, in Christ you move from your former way of doing life to a new way of doing life. Not only that, but he takes us to a new level of understanding of how to do the new life in Jesus Christ. You have been given gifts of grace through the person of the Holy Spirit so that you can steward that grace culture. I'm looking at part of God's plan to bring his grace into this world. That's you. Do you understand that? Now, I know the person of the Holy Spirit does this ministry, of course. But you know what? You're part of that ministry too. Amen? Every single one of you who has received Jesus Christ as their Savior and are filled with the person of the Holy Spirit, you are God's plan of bringing his grace into this culture. Amen? Amen? You guys are second hour, you're awake now. I give first hour a little bit more leniency, but second hour, I expect a response. You are God's means of grace. So our big thought today is this. The born again, Holy Spirit filled follower is gifted for service that then ministers God's grace. So everyone that's born again in here, I'm going to say it again. Every one of you that's born again in here and would say, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Every one of you then should be filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. You are graced with gifts so that you can serve in such a way that you are an instrument that brings God's grace into your situation, wherever you find yourself. This is exciting. I don't know how you think. But I love to participate in things. This is professional football watching season. 
I love to watch football, but more than I like to watch sports, I like to participate in sports. I like to participate. I like to do things myself. Uh, if, if we need to replace a window at home, I say, well, how hard can that be? So I just do it myself. Besides, you can go to YouTube now, right? And you can look at anything. And they tell you how to replace any car part. Any window. It's, it's not that hard to do. And I, I feel like we, as the body of Jesus Christ, we cannot be content to be in the bleachers and on the sideline of what God is up to. We have got to individually want to be part of the play of the game. Amen? You are meant to participate in this thing called the movement of Christianity. And God has gifted you, every single one of you in here, with gifts of grace so that you can be an active of active teammate, so to speak, on God's team of ministering his grace. So I have a challenge for you today. I want you to begin to think differently about Christianity. I want you to have a paradigm shift. I want you to see yourself as an instrument of God's grace wherever you go. I am God's man. I am God's woman. He has graced me with gifts so that I can impart that grace to those around me. I want you to begin to see yourself that way. I, I praise God because so many people at Grace Point already understand this and live this way. But I want to challenge you, if you're not doing this, to begin to, to have that paradigm shift. Now, when I use that word paradigm shift, let me explain what I mean. Back in the day when I grew up, Swiss, Swiss made a really good watch. They were known for their mechanical works, and they made this beautiful watch that I could never afford. And then along comes electronic age. And the manufacturers of the Swiss watch said, why would anybody ever want an electronic watch? Do you have one? I have an Apple watch now. It even tells me my heart rate, and sometimes it's even accurate. Right? Why would anybody want an electronic watch? How many of you have an old mechanical watch on your wrist right now? Anybody? Some of you do? You're vintage. Good for you guys. Some old school folk in here, you know. But, but most people are technologically more astute. No, I'm just joking. You know, most of you have electronic watches because they're way cheaper. Well, maybe not anymore. Who knows? I don't know what I'm trying to even say there. Anyway, but there is a paradigm shift and that Swiss manufacturer went out of business because they didn't jump into the electronic market, basically. And, and companies like Apple or a lot of the Sony and all those jumped into the, the watch manufacturing and they just took the business over. Several hundred years ago, the church went through a paradigm shift called the First Reformation. And the First Reformation was all about getting the Word of God back in the people's hands. And when that happened, the face of Christianity changed. What we need to have happen today in our age is, a, is another reformation of that same kind of magnitude, only it needs to be a reformation of a, of a different nature. Randy Pope, a pastor and author, uh, wrote this uh, book called The Intentional Church. And I, I want to read a quote to you from his book, The Intentional Church. It talks about this next reformation that I think it's needed in the church. And I, I pray that you see this also. Uh, the first reformation gave the word of God back to the people of God. Today we need a second reformation, Pope says, that gives the work of God to the people of God. This will not happen until laity accept their role as ministers. And I know this can sound a little intimidating to you at first blush, but this is the good life. This is where the fun of Christianity is to be had. This is where you begin to see God really move and do things in your life, and you begin to realize, I am part of your plan, God. I'm not just a spectator. I'm a participant in what you're up to and what you're doing in this world. And that's a good place to be at when it comes to serving the Lord God. I want to talk to you for a few moments about our vision statement here at Grace Point. I asked Pastor Ben not to talk on this on purpose because I want to talk with you about it. Our, our vision statement is threefold. We want people who come here, first of all, to encounter the grace of God. Now, what we mean by that is we want you to run in right into Jesus, right into Jesus. In fact, uh, I want the reality of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 to be something that we experience here at Grace Point. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, um, not of works, lest any man should boast. And what we want is for people to understand, I come to God by his enablement and by his power. And when you come here, I want you to run into the power of God. Amen. And that should be a fresh encounter every week and every day and every hour, depending on how tuned in you are to the person of the Holy Spirit, that this, this encounter of grace should be an ongoing kind of interaction we have with our God. And then secondly, we want people to grow in grace. 
What happens oftentimes, especially I think in American culture a little bit, is that we understand we can't do anything to be saved and come to God. It's by His grace, by His enablement through faith. And then we get saved and we think we have to work really hard at being okay with God. And that's just, that's, that's, that's nonsense. What, what growing in grace means is that I, I'm understanding as, as I mature my faith that it's a dependency thing on God. Not that I try harder to do better. I learn how to depend more on God. I learn how to ask the Holy Spirit to equip me more. I get more tuned into what God is doing. I become more dependent upon him. I'm growing in grace. I'm abiding in God more and more. The older I get and the more mature I get in Jesus Christ, the more I realize how desperately I need Jesus. Amen? And how desperately I need the person of the Holy Spirit to do in me that which I cannot do in myself. And now this morning we're to this third level of our vision statement, and that's to be a grace giver. That God has given us gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we then can steward those gifts to those around us, and we become then instruments of God's grace to our family, to our friends, to our culture, to our workplace, wherever we find ourselves. Now, I've been talking a lot on, on grace. Let me define grace for you this morning. This will be helpful, I think. Grace is God's divine favor on people on account of the work of Jesus Christ, because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's a real standard definition of grace. But I think the next part of the definition is very helpful. Grace means divine enablement. And I like this last part of the definition the best. It is the power of God to be and do that which you cannot be and do on your own. It's the power of God to be and do that which you cannot be and do on your own. Grace is not a synonym for forgiveness or overlooking an offense, not in biblical terms. In biblical terms, grace is a much, much more powerful word than that. It means the empowerment of God unleashed in our lives. Basically, we become the recipients of grace when the person, the Holy Spirit, fills us when we're converted and when we ask him to fill us. And then he does things in us that we cannot do in ourselves. Amen? Are you getting this understanding of grace? Because if you don't understand what grace means, you'll not understand our vision statement and you won't understand anything I'm talking about today. So grace is that power of God unleashing our lives to do in us what we cannot do ourselves. Now, God has said through the apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4.10 that I have given you gifts so that you are empowered to do in your lives and in people's lives around you things you could not do on your own. That's how we become an instrument in grace. Now, we are designed to do good works. We are designed to interact with culture. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance to do. So we're designed to do this. God has equipped us to do this. And when we do this kind of things, when we do these good works, when we're fueled by the person of the Holy Spirit, we're doing the good works with that kind of motivation, then that creates goodwill wherever we find ourselves. And that gives us opportunity to share the good news of why we're doing these things. We can give an answer for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So all this kind of ties together. Now, our key verse this morning then is 1 Peter 4.10. I just want to hammer on this. This is our key verse today. This is what I'm looking at in the scripture that we read today because I don't have time to look at the rest of it. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So God has given us gifts through the infilling power of the person of the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill the mandate to go do good works and we fulfill that mandate in such a way that we bring the grace of God to bear in the situation we find ourselves in. So I'm looking at a whole bunch of people who are God's means of grace. Amen? Are you seeing this? Now, I know the person of the Holy Spirit does this, but we're to play the game too. And you and I are to be grace givers also. So... What I want to do the rest of the hour is just talk to you for a few moments on what are these gifts of grace that the person of the Holy Spirit bestows upon the people of God. What are they? And so I'm going to talk on those for a few moments. And before I get into those, I want to give a couple disclaimers. Serving is the venue through which the gifts of the Holy Spirit flow. So if you want to see these things manifested in your life, you've got to get in the game, so to speak, and you've got to serve. 
You've got to be dependent upon and needful of the ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit through you. They're not, Holy, these Holy Spirit gifts, they're not so that we can feel more spiritual or have a wow moment. These gifts are imparted to the people of God when they're willing to serve authentically and follow after the Lord God hard. Second disclaimer, spiritual gifts are not a means and not a measurement of spirituality. Okay? They're not a measurement of spirituality. In fact, in the teachings on spiritual gifts found in in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 11, the Apostle Paul said, and these spiritual gifts are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. They are not a measurement of spirituality. Now, I think it's really helpful when we're talking about the topic of spiritual gifts to label them this way. These are the M&Ms of Holy Spirit gifts. Now, did you receive a package of M&Ms on the way in? Did you? Hopefully you did. If you didn't get a package of these, I'm sorry. You can get a package on the way out. But now you need to pull them out, and I want to talk to you for a few moments on the M&Ms of spiritual gifts. When you look at an M&M, at least the ones we have, we don't have peanut M&Ms in here, even though they're like my favorite, because I know there's peanut allergies all over the place. So we have regular M&Ms. When you look at an M&M, you notice that they're multicolored, right? And I've been told that they taste different. But I never suck on mine long enough to know that. How about you? But some who have good taste tell me they don't taste the same. They all have a little bit of a different taste. And they all have a different look. There's blue, red, green. I have no green here, but yellow and brown. You get what I'm saying. And, and this reminds me of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, are, 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 they look different in, in us. They taste different in each one of us. But at the center of every M&M is what? Uh, milk, chocolate, delight. And it's the same, right? It's not different. And the same goes with the, whole, with the whole, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. So you and I are going to have different gifts of the Holy Spirit as he dis, dis, determines. And, and we're going to maybe look a little different. Chris and I are going to look different. You know what I'm saying? Travis and I are going to look a little different because God's going to gift us differently. But at the core, what's going on? It's the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the milk chocolate goodness that we all get to experience it's the same. You follow what I'm saying? And, and so this is like the, so when we look at spiritual gifts, they can be likened to M&Ms. I just want you to get a picture of kind of how this works. Now, there's another reason I call these the M&Ms, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because the, the Holy Spirit giftedness can be divided into three categories, and they all begin with the a word that begins with M. So you can call them the M&Ms that way, but this is a lot more fun, isn't it? To have an M&M. So go ahead and eat them if you want. I mean, you should be eating them right now. I mean, enjoying the M&Ms. Unless you have something against M&Ms, that's fine. So let's go to these different gift categories that are identified for us. Let's begin to kind of flesh this out. I'm going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. They kind of outline the three gift categories. And then elsewhere in the New Testament, the, 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 they're explained even more detail. And here's what I want to do. Here's my goal. Here's why I'm talking this morning with you on, on, on the M&Ms, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's because Peter says this statement in 1 Peter 4.10, that you and I are the recipient of gifts so that we can steward God's grace in its various forms. That's such a small, concise statement with such huge implications. You can read through and go, oh, okay, that's nice. No, you don't want to do that because oh, so much of the New Testament explains what that statement means. It's like we have so much grace given to us that we ought to read that statement in 1 Peter 4, 10 and go, hallelujah, God, you've called me to be a grace giver in this life and you have adequately graced me to accomplish that task. So by day's end, I hope you see that. So let's begin with the motivational gifts. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, we're told this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Now that word gift used in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 is the exact same Greek word in the original text of the New Testament used back in 1 Peter 4, 10. And that word gift means charisma. And that word charisma, the Greek word means gift of grace imparted from God. It's an enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer to exercise a gift for the edification of others. Now, that same Greek word gift 
that's found in 1 Peter 4.10 and 1 Corinthians 12.4 is also found in Romans 12.6. Only in the case of Romans 12.6, it's contained in a teaching on what these gifts look like, what these motivational gifts look like. Let me read that for you, beginning with verse 4. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we through many Though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. There it is. Same Greek word, charisma. According to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is, encour- if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So let me kind of explain motivation gifts to you. Motivational gifts determine why you do what you do and how you see the world. Incredibly important. These, these gifts determine why you do what you do and how you see the world. So you need to be understanding that God has graced you this way so that when you are out there in the world, when you're interacting with one another as a church, you can bring a perspective that maybe others don't have. So if you're gifted with serving, you're naturally going to see service opportunities all around you, right? Whether it's at work, whether it's here in the church, serve then and do so with the love of Christ. And get this, a lot of people around you won't see serving as a priority like you. You know what? They don't have that gift. They're not tuned in. And so you can bring that ministry, so to speak, in a, in, a, in a way, in, 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 a, in, in situations where maybe others don't see it, and you, by doing that, are bringing Christ's presence to bear on that situation. If, you're, you know, if your giftedness is, is prophetic, then you're going to be a person that has a high regard for truth. Then you're going to bring truth to bear in whatever situation you find yourself in. Most likely, if you have that giftedness, you'll stand alone. You'll say hard things. Uh, do so with a... With a, with a face of Christ, so to speak, involved with that, do so in the right kind of way, and you can be an instrument of God's grace that changes situations. Amen? You follow what I'm saying here? If you're a merciful person, I have a couple daughters that are very merciful, then you're going to empathize with people really well. And, and you can be ones that, no matter where you find yourself, you can readily relate to somebody else, and you can bring the love of Christ to that person like very few others will be able to do. Because you're an instrument of God's grace. By the way, these motivational gifts as well as all the gifts, they're imparted to the body, not just to me. I only have one or two, just like you do. This is why you need to have these things working in your life. You can't expect your pastor to do them all. I do not have the gift of mercy. I can be merciful. I work really hard at it. But I know if somebody gets hurt, my first thought is, that's a long way from your heart. You're fine. Throw some dirt on it. You're fine. I'm not going to wrap my arm around you and cry with you. I just don't function that way. So when I go visit you at the hospital, I'm not going to be very merciful. I have to work hard at it. It exhausts me. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to say, do you know Jesus? Yes, you do. Good. You're heaven bound. God bless you. See you later. (laughs) That's why if you're really merciful... You need to visit that person in the hospital too. Because maybe they need a hug. Maybe they need someone to cry and say how bad, you know, you're having it. That's why the ministry of the body is so very, very important. That's why you all need to get into the game. So let's move on to the next category of gifts. They're frequently called ministry gifts. Uh, As we continue on in 1 Corinthians 12, going down to verse 5, it says, There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Service means, in the original Greek, ministry gifts that provide needed service. These gifts enable the follower of God to serve the church and serve this world. Just as in the case of the motivational gifts, they're fleshed out elsewhere in Scripture. So if we go over to Ephesians 4, we see these gifts listed over there in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. Let me read that to you. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip. Did you hear what the function of these group of people are? to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up 
until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So I want to share with you something fairly important here. This group of, 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 of giftedness is for the equipping of the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can do the ministry. See, a raw model of church way too long has been the pastor does all the ministry. That's a terrible model of the church, whether it be small or large. The church does the ministry. The pastor's main role is to equip, right? So if I am busy doing all the ministry and not equipping you, shame on me and shame on you. That's not how the body of Christ is supposed to work. First and primary is my calling to be an equipper, and first and primary is your calling to be ministers. Amen? You seeing how this works? And so this gift group is basically there to enable the body of Christ to serve effectively. That's your next point. These gifts enable the body of Christ to serve effectively. Now, I know I'm covering these gift listings in a super quick way, but I'm not trying to explain all of them this morning. My goal is for you to see that statement made in 1 Peter 4.10 where the Apostle Peter says, we have received gifts so that we can administer, that we can steward God's grace effectively in our culture. I want you to see how big that statement is and how much God has graced his people to accomplish that. So let's move on to the last of our NMM gift category this morning, manifestation gifts. Manifestation gifts. Continuing on in 1 Corinthians 12, let's jump right now to verse 6. It talks about these gifts there. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now that word workings comes from this Greek word that means gifts that make visible the power or the energy of God. Now in 1 Corinthians 12, you've got to understand the Apostle Paul is doing some corrective teaching to the Corinthian church who are all into signs and wonders and the gifts of power. They are really out of balance wanting those kinds of things. And before Paul even gets to this gift listing that I'm about to share with you from 1 Corinthians 12, he says, listen, there's first of all motivational gifts. We talked about those. Those are found over in Romans chapter 12. There are secondly ministry gifts. They're found and explained in Ephesians chapter 4. And now he gets to the, the manifestation gifts. It's a corrective teaching because the Corinthian church was wrongly seeking these things out and thinking this was a measurement of spirituality, and it is not. Let me read to you about these gifts. These are the wild kinds of gifts. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages. And to still another, the interpretation of those tongues or languages. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So these gifts give power to ministry. They give power. They get oomph to ministry. And did you notice here all the qualifications that the Apostle Paul is putting around these gifts? For the common good. God gives them just as he determines. See, the Corinthians and the Corinthian church were misusing this giftedness. They were seeking these. They wanted these because they're cool gifts. And they wanted to see them just for the kicks of seeing them. And, and the Apostle Paul is saying, that's not how this works. God gives as he determines as you serve and as you are humble, and as you are seeking for God to do a work in other people's lives. And I'm convinced that the reason we don't see these kinds of gifts uh, being authentically used is twofold. First, they're wrongly pursued because people just think they're cool, and that that's not why God answers prayer or does works. Secondly, these gifts only tend to be manifested if we're willing to truly serve and put ourselves out there for God. So there you go, the M&Ms of the, uh, gifts. Motivational gifts, ministry gifts, manifestation gifts. And I'm not trying to downplay manifestation gifts at all. I personally have been the recipient at times of a word of knowledge. That's cool. When God does that, that's really neat. I've seen miracles. I've seen some healings. God's good, amen? He does these kinds of things. But I think they're done as his followers are really in step with the Holy Spirit serving authentically, desiring that God's name be glorified. They're not done in, God, in the midst of God's people because 
people want a wow moment. You following what I'm saying here? This is super important to get. So here's how I would summarize these, these M&Ms uh, uh, of gifts. Um, the, 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 the motivational gifts help us to have different perspectives. So if Julie has a different perspective than me and we interact with each other, we begin to go, oh, okay, I didn't see that. You're an encourager. I'm not naturally an encourager. And here's how you can encourage in that situation. And here's how maybe if I'm teaching motivated, here's how we can teach in that situation. That needs to happen out there. Amen? You don't know what a gift you are to people when you bring these gifts of the Holy Spirit to bear on where you find yourself in life. Amen? So, so that helps bring this perspective uh, 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 to, to life. The, the ministry gifts then are for the equipping of the church so the church can be really effective in her service uh, uh, to one another and to culture. And then the manifestation gets, wow. They just make you go, wow. God is great. Amen? God is great. So now we see a fuller picture of the statement of 1 Peter 4.10 that was summarized in our big thought. The born-again, Holy Spirit-filled follower is gifted for service that ministers God's grace. Now, when we say that statement, you understand that's the M&Ms of gifts. That's motivational gifts. That's ministry gifts. That's manifestation gifts. And it's mind-boggling when you begin to see what that little statement by Peter implies and it's mind-boggling when you begin to think about the application of it. Amen? And that's where I'm going to leave you today. So we are out of time and I'm done. Let's pray, huh? God, you're so good. I think that you could have made this so much more difficult. You have every right to rule any way you want. You're sovereign. You're over all of us. And in your graciousness, in your sufficiency, in your sovereignty, you have given those who are born again in Jesus the person of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we ask, fill our hearts anew today. And for some of us, maybe we need to ask for the very first time, Holy Spirit, fill my heart and run my life. And God, I pray that you would gift the body here, those who are born again followers, with these gifts of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make yourself known to us this way that we would operate in these motivational ministry and manifestation gifts that you've made available so that we become then two instruments of grace to our culture, to our family, to our friends, and to our church. Oh God, thank you that you've endued us with this kind of power. It's amazing. I know for some in here, Lord, maybe the first step today is just acknowledge that they need you, Jesus, as their Savior. Because this all starts when we, when we actually say, Jesus, we need you to be our Savior and Lord. And then we get to step into this good life of having the Holy Spirit doing us what we cannot do ourselves. And then we can become these instruments of grace to a culture that's desperately needy in seeing how God really works. So I pray, Lord, that you would do lots of work in our lives today that are beyond our capabilities. And Holy Spirit, we just pray, come in and make yourself known to us and minister through us and fill us, Lord. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, hey, on our webpage, we have a gift test for you to take. So if you're curious and pursuing some of this on your own, you can go there and take that gift test and it'll, it'll help you understand who you are. But get this. If you love Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he's given you this stuff, whether you know it or not. So don't worry so much about labeling it. Worry about being filled with the person of the Holy Spirit and being tuned into what he wants to do in your life and then be obedient to him. Amen?